Welcome to this webinar about how to calculate employee turnover rates in your organization. This is the first of two webinars, which together will cover everything you need to calculate your turnover rates, even if you're completely new to statistics and data analysis. In this first session, I'm going to explain everything you need to know in order to successfully calculate your employee turnover rates using your tool of choice, even if that's a calculator. I'll walk you through all the data needed for those calculations, plus the formulas. I'll also explain why turnover rates are such a critical metric for HR and the business. My name is John Lipinski, and I will be your host for this session. By way of background, I have a PhD in Cognitive Psychology, and I am currently the head of research and innovation for an assessment and human analytics company in the United States that serves clients around the globe. When I'm not working at the job I love, I have fun posting on hranalytics101.com and working with my wonderful partners here at Analytics and HR. Today's session is all about turnover metrics, undoubtedly the most talked about area in HR analytics. When we're done, you'll know the essentials of measuring turnover and be able to immediately apply these lessons to your HR analytics function at your organization. We have a lot to cover in this session, so let me give you an overview. We'll start out with a basic definition of what turnover is and why it's so important. Next, we'll take a deep dive into the turnover measurement formula and show you three different ways to apply it. Then we'll build in this knowledge and show you how to calculate annualized turnover. Finally, we'll wrap it all up with a short review. Turnover gets a ton of attention in virtually all organizations, especially larger organizations with mature HR functions and the seedlings of an HR analytics process. First, you can actually measure it. This is in sharp contrast to a lot of other topics in HR, such as culture and fit and flourishing. Those elements are critical, and I would argue that we can actually begin to put some numbers on those areas too. But, fair or not, a lot of HR is viewed as a bit squishy or ill-defined. Turnover rate, on the other hand, has a clear number. Second, turnover is associated with costs. The cost of replacing someone who leaves voluntarily has been estimated to be between 60% and 200% of their annual salary. That might sound a bit high, and it'll certainly differ according to company and region and roles, but whatever the cost, it's not trivial. To understand why it costs companies so much, think about all the different things that are impacted. On the HR side, you first have exit interviews and administrative costs just to move the person out. Then you need to find someone to fill that role. So then you need to pull in recruiters and get the job posted, pull in and filter candidates, conduct time-consuming interviews and make an offer, and then get them to accept the offer, get them through orientation and get them on the factory floor, or get them in a chair, and on it goes. And then you got to get them trained up. That's just a ton of resources and a ton of time. And that lost time means lost productivity while each of those steps is being carried out. Every day that role is not filled is a day that that job is not getting done, or it's getting done by someone else and some other work now must be ignored. One way or the other, when people leave, productivity typically takes a hit. There are also indirect productivity losses. For example, think of the team members that tap that expertise. Where to find a file, what person to ask, who knows that process. All those little things that fall under the header of organizational knowledge. When someone with organizational knowledge leaves, they take that knowledge with them, leaving teammates and managers without a valuable resource. That's tough to quantify, but it's still a real cost. All that said, I should point out that not all voluntary departures are bad. Let's be honest. Sometimes people just need to move on, even if an organization can't quite get rid of them. In addition, and on a more positive note, it's important to be bringing in new people with new ideas, new skills, and new perspectives. A natural flow of new hires can bring the energy and change that keeps organizations growing and improving. Too little turnover and things can get stagnant. On a more human level, sometimes people just need a change or need to seize a new opportunity. Moreover, if an organization is losing people because it does a great job of developing talent and making its employees attractive candidates for other jobs and creating opportunities for them, it's actually doing something good for everyone. Now that you have the big picture, let's dig in by first defining employee turnover rate. Turnover is simply the percentage of your workforce that has left voluntarily in a given period of time. It is usually calculated on a monthly, quarterly, or annual basis, and we'll cover those different time windows in depth coming up. It's important to note that I specifically said voluntary turnover, that is, employees leaving of their own free will. This is distinguished from involuntary turnover, in which employees are let go or dismissed or invited to flourish elsewhere. The difference is important because the causes of voluntary turnover and solutions to voluntary turnover problems will be very different from issues tied to involuntary turnover. Both are important, but they need to be considered separately, at least when it comes to the initial measurement. 
So the first big thing to remember is that turnover rate is the percentage of voluntary departures in a given period of time. That's the big idea. So now here are the specific steps. First, count up the number of people who left voluntarily during the time period you're interested in. For example, if you want to calculate turnover for the last month, just count up the number of people who left during that month. Now for our second step. Take the total number of voluntary departures in step one and divide by the average number of people who were employed during that time period. So for example, if 10 people left the company in April and we had on average 400 employees during that same month, then our turnover rate would be 10 divided by 400, which works out to a 2.5% turnover rate for that month. In a formula, it looks like this. More compactly, we can say that we are dividing by the average of the number of employees at the beginning and the end of the period. Before we work through some examples, I want to focus for a minute on that headcount calculation, which is the bottom part of our formula, where we're dividing by the average number of employees. Those new to HR analytics often find this step in turnover calculation confusing at first. I know I did when I first saw it. So let's focus first on that calculation of the average itself. The step is simple. To get the average number of employees during a period, count the number of people employed at the beginning of the period, and add that to the number of people at the end of the period, and divide by 2. That's it. Number of employees at the beginning, plus the number of employees at the end, divided by 2. It's just an average, nothing new or special here. But the part that many find confusing is why we're taking this step. The goal of measuring turnover rate is communicating how many people left relative to the size of the company. If I tell you 100 people left my company last month, that number by itself doesn't tell you much. So if my company has roughly 300 people in it, well, that's obviously really bad. But on the other hand, if my company is a huge multinational like Siemens with over 300,000 employees, obviously that number is really kind of trivial. So the question then becomes, how do I measure turnover relative to the size of my workforce? This might sound straightforward, but when do we want to measure the size of the workforce? The first of the month? The last of the month? The first Tuesday of every month? Which one is it? The reality is that our workforce is constantly changing with new people coming in and going out all the time. The solution adopted then is just to take the average of the size of the workforce during the period you're talking about. So if you're talking about measuring turnover rate in a given month, then you would take the average of the number of people at the beginning of the month and at the end of the month. If you instead want the turnover rate for the first quarter, then you would take the average of the number of employees at the beginning of that quarter and at the end of the quarter. To be sure, you could come up with a much more complicated approach, but the average works well enough and it's simple to implement. It captures those who stick around and those who are new and worked at least part of the period as well as those who left but still worked at some point in that period too. Moreover, if you carry out your measures repeatedly, you'll have a consistent measure of how the number is changing over time. This is not physics or chemistry. So taking the average of the workforce at the beginning and the end of the period is good enough. It tells us what we need to know to get a relative measure of our turnover and with minimum effort. You have the essence of the turnover metric, so now let's build on that learning by creating some turnover metrics for three different time frames, monthly, quarterly, and annually. We'll start with monthly. Let's suppose it's May and we're being asked for the turnover rate from April. What three numbers do we need? First, we need to know the number of people who left during the month of April. That will be the number on the top. For the denominator, we need just two numbers, the number of people employed at the beginning of the month and the number of those employed at the end of the month. Let's make that concrete and suppose 20 people left voluntarily during April. In addition, let's suppose we had 1,010 at the beginning of the month and 1,020 at the end of the month. Plugging these values into our formula, we get 20 divided by 1,015, which is our average headcount for that month, which we measure by averaging 1,010 and 1,020. The total result then is a roughly 2% turnover for the month of April. Quarterly turnover works the exact same way, except we're now just taking the number of people leaving during the whole quarter and dividing by the average number of people employed at the beginning and the end of the quarter. In this example, we'll say we want the turnover rate from the first quarter. So let's say there are 19 who left during the quarter. At the start of the quarter, on January 1st, there were 307 employees. At the end of March, which is the end of the quarter, there were 299, for an average headcount of 303 over the whole quarter. Plugging this into our formula, we get a turnover rate of 6.3% for the first quarter. One final example, annual turnover. Again, same formula, just a different time period. So in this example, we'll say 117 people left over the course of the year. Further, let's suppose there were 804 employed as of January 1st and 906 as of December 31st. 
Plugging these values into our formula, we get 13.7 as our turnover rate for the whole year. One question that often pops up right about now for those measuring turnover is, what counts as the last day? The date of termination is typically the last day they worked, and this is what you should be using in your calculation. So if we're calculating the turnover rate for April, and the person's last day was April 30th, this is also the date of termination. It's the last day for which they were paid. This person should therefore count towards the April turnover numbers because their last workday was in April, not May. So far then, we've talked about monthly, quarterly, and annual turnover. One question that you might have at this point is, well, which one should I use? Which one is better? To help you think through this, let's take a moment to talk about measurement frequency because people often ask what turnover measure is best. The first thing to note about any measure, whether we're talking about turnover, revenue, employment rates, the stock market, or really any other measure, is that measurements are noisy. By noise, here I mean the fluctuations that cause the number measured to move up and down randomly. So in the case of turnover, sometimes turnover will just be higher in some months than in others for no particular reason. When you flip a coin, you don't expect to have alternating heads and tails even though the coin is fair. In the long run, each side will win 50% of the time. But in a given short run, say 10 flips, you'll often get more heads or more tails. The world is lumpy, and turnover will be too. Why does this matter? Because when we're looking at turnover, we're usually interested in changes in the turnover rate. But that random noise and those fluctuations make it harder for us to tell what is quote true change, a change we should pay attention to, or a change that we can actually do something about. The trick then is to balance the need for current information with the need to increase the window of measurement and smooth out the noise. I would generally recommend a quarterly measurement of turnover, or at least a running average covering three months. This will help prevent you from treating the noise like signal and overreacting to truly random changes in your day-to-day -day turnover. Circumstances differ, and certainly you should use your own best judgment in consultation with leadership to determine the best measure. In some cases, it might make sense to look at your turnover number more frequently, say monthly. So for example, increasing your wage rate for hourly workers to stem the tide of employee departures to other companies, or considering a wage pause in the context of a worsening labor market or global recession. Just remember that the more frequently you measure something, the more noise you are incorporating. So far, we've covered the basic turnover formula and examples for measuring monthly, quarterly, and annual turnover. Now we're gonna to move to a closely related measure annualized turnover. One of the problems with measuring turnover from periods of different length is that it's hard to compare rates from these different periods and tell whether things are going well or going poorly. For example, if I say that we had a 2% monthly turnover rate in October, but your only reference point is a 4% annual turnover rate from last year, you can't directly compare those two amounts because they cover different time periods. To solve this, leaders and HR professionals use what is referred to as an annualized turnover rate. An annualized turnover rate is simply the conversion of some turnover rates calculated for some given period of time to an annual rate basis. It answers the question, at this rate, what would turnover look like for a whole year? By converting it to an annual rate, we can compare turnover rates calculated from different time periods. But intuitively, many of you already know how to compare them. You just might not refer to it as an annualized rate. So, to continue with our example, how does a 2% monthly turnover rate in October compare with last year's annual rate of 4%? Well, suppose I lost 2% of my people every single month for a year. So 2% times 12 months would be an annualized rate of 24%. Comparing that annualized rate with last year's annual rate of 4%, we can see that's a pretty incredible increase. As another example, if I have a 5% turnover rate for the first quarter of the year, this works out to an annualized rate of 20% per year. 5% per quarter for four quarters gives me 20% for the whole year. But as simple as this is, it has real value because it lets us assess and compare values covering different time periods. Here you can see the formula for annualized turnover rate if your period is in months or quarters. In words, you first calculate the turnover rate for the given period of interest. Then multiply that rate by the inverse of the proportion of the year accounted for by that period over which you calculated that turnover rate. Here, I presented it in terms of months because we're often calculating monthly or quarterly turnover periods. If you're trying to annualize a quarterly turnover rate, then you have a three-month period. Let's try another example with our formula in hand. Suppose my turnover rate was 8% for the month of September. Because I'm looking only at a single month, this period accounts for one twelfth of a year. To find my annualized turnover rate, then, I would multiply that 8% by 12, which is the inverse of one twelfth. 
the result is 96%, which in practice would be very bad. That's pretty steep, but it makes sense. If I'm losing 8% of my people every month, then I would lose 96% of my people over the course of 12 months if turnover were to continue at that same rate. As a second example, again explicitly using our formula, suppose I have a turnover rate of 4% in the second quarter. There are 3 months in each quarter, so I would multiply that 4% by 12 over 3, which gives me a 16% annualized turnover rate. Everyone wants to solve the problem of turnover and retention, but it's absolutely critical from a business standpoint to be clear about the problem that you're actually solving or whether you even have a problem to begin with. Before increasing starting salaries and bonuses and giving away better titles or beginning some new and potentially expensive wellness program, be clear about the actual problem you are solving. A key element of this evaluation is data. I would suggest the following three steps to help you determine whether you actually have a turnover problem. Number one, determine who is leaving. Break down turnover by some basic buckets like male and female, age, performance measures, salary, and engagement. Number two, look at the trends in your data over the last two to three years. I mean, actually plot your data over time. Is there a clear trend or is there just some random movement up and down around a basically stable mean? Number three, plot your data over time with other relevant data, such as local unemployment rates, company revenues and profits, and any major impact events such as federal legislation impacting the business, the departure of a CEO, or a takeover bid. You may have some other elements to add here too. The key point is do not just look at your turnover numbers in isolation. Given those steps and ensuing discussions with leaders and colleagues, what emerges? Do you actually have a problem? If so, what target population or path makes the most sense? As part of any later action planning process, I would suggest the following considerations. First, if you're seeing departures with your established employees, ask questions such as the following. Are there barriers to career and professional development? Has the stress level for that role changed in recent years? Has the team or business area seen departures of key leaders? Have there been other management or cultural changes? Are there basic work-life coordination issues at play? For turnover issues tied to new hires, on the other hand, I would consider some different questions. Was the job different from what was expected? Are recruiters honestly and accurately describing the job? Is there poor training? Is there high stress or high pressure? Are there inflexible hours or work-life coordination issues? Are there known issues with poor management or poor supervisors? There's no guarantee that targeted intervention efforts will work as planned, but you need to be clear about the problem you're actually solving, not the problem you think you are solving. As the business leader and inventor Charles Kettering once said, a problem well stated is half solved. Let's quickly review what we've covered in today's webinar. We started out with a basic definition of turnover and why it matters. We then shifted into the turnover formula itself and how to use it to measure monthly, quarterly, or annual turnover. Along the way, we addressed some common questions that arise when measuring turnover. Next, we talked about annualized turnover, which allows us to compare turnover data gathered over different period lengths. Finally, we talked about taking action and how your analytic skills can be leveraged to identify and frame any solution designs. Turnover is a huge issue for HR organizations and always will be. As HR analytics professionals, you're in a great position to help your organization get the right metrics, define and clarify any problems, and lay the foundation for strong people decision making. Companies use terms and measures differently, so first, remember to be clear and consistent about your metrics and terminology, about what you're actually measuring. Second, Use the wide array of data at hand, not just the departure numbers. Get comfortable exploring ideas and then confirming or disconfirming your intuitions or those of your leaders with numbers. Data is a tool. Use it. Finally, people are complicated, messy creatures and HR analytics is not chemistry or physics. Don't obsess about little changes and random fluctuations in the numbers. Focus on the big picture. Look for trends and patterns and put yourself in the shoes of the people you're analyzing. Remember that these are living, breathing people with responsibilities and families and aspirations and concerns. If we use analytics to guide us in the right direction, the big stuff will take care of itself. So that's it for today. Thank you so much. We look forward to seeing you in the next webinar.